Okay, so it's after seven Eastern. So uh, I want to welcome everyone to the fundamentals of building a neurosurgery practice as part of the Young Neurosurgeons NREF webinar series. Um, today we're looking forward to continuing to march through from medical students to postgraduate neurosurgery uh, relevant topics that can really help people um, uh, to focus on these things uh, and some of the unwritten type rules that. Uh, that we have in neurosurgery that, that aren't in textbooks, um, but would be very helpful to discuss um, in this webinar series. So the goal of this series is to provide students, young neurosurgeons with a timely information, education, inspiration towards a career in neurosurgery. So we've all seen this episodes before, you know all about that. I wanna remind everybody, we do have one more main uh, webinar episode. Oops, my pictures aren't coming through. Um, Sunday, May 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and uh, although my picture didn't come through, it is going to be with Dr. Henry Marsh, um, which is why it's on Sunday due to the time difference between UK and uh, US. Um, so please keep an eye out on social media for that. Uh, despite my web PowerPoint looking pretty good about five minutes ago, it is now all the images have evaded us again. Um, so what is the WNS? It was founded in 1931 as the Harvard Cushing Society. Um, it's a worldwide scientific education association with more than 10,000 members. Uh, the, the goal of the organization has many roles, but it guides the field of neurosurgery uh, from the national perspective and to some degree the international perspective, and its roles include education, advocacy, and promoting the highest quality of patient care. Uh, the Young Neurosurgery Committee is, uh, provides representation to the WNS leadership from young neurosurgeons. Uh, we develop future leaders of neurosurgery and provide a channel for young neurosurgeons to impact the direction of the specialty. So what is NREF? So this is the Young Neurosurgeons NREF webinar. So it's the Neurosurgery Research and Education Foundation, which is a not-for-profit 501c3 organization created by the WNS. Um, it supports basic science clinical research as well as lifelong education, uh, educational courses for residents, et cetera, um, that foster improved outcomes for our patients with neurosurgical diseases. There are a tremendous amount of their, um, of their uh, fundraising uh, is paid is put into education of residents and resident research. And so we very much appreciate the support of this webinar uh, as well. Um, again, sorry, the pictures aren't coming through for some reason. Um, but uh, I wanted to introduce our co-hosts, um, Dr. Randy D'Amico, who's assistant professor in neurosurgery at Northwell Lenox Hill. Um, he is a long, almost his fourth year, or you, you're off now, right? Full four years in the Young Neurosurgery Going Committee. into my, going into my third, yeah. yeah going into your third? Oh, I thought you, thought you were done, so I'm sorry I aged you too quickly. Yeah. Going into your third year no, as a <laughs> member. Um, he is uh, one of the hosts of the Tumor Talk webinar, which is excellent. Um, and so welcome, Randy, and um, he'll, he'll be having a prominent role as he uh, has been an instrumental in, in um, making uh, this happen. Um, also, Frank Antonello, which is another one of our neurosurgery members, he's the current tumor section liaison, and um, he is assistant professor of neurosurgery at the University of California, uh, University of Southern California, and did he make it on? There he is. Hey, Frank, how are you? No worries, Jeremiah. Uh, first off, you know, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, and I know that you do this with a whole team of people who have helped out. They've been wonderful. So thanks to them. And obviously the co-panelists. Um, it is a privilege and an honor uh, to get to introduce Rick. Um, he has been, you know, an adopted mentor to me without a doubt. Uh, just for everyone who, who doesn't know him, Rick um, did his undergraduate studies at Duke, went on to do medical school at Johns Hopkins, he did his neurosurgery training and residency at Columbia before doing a tumor fellowship at Sloan Kettering and then ultimately ending up in Miami where he's kind of built what he's going to talk to us about. I think, um, you know, what's key to understanding Rick and, and what I think makes him so special is, is you have to realize that Rick is, you know, he's a legend in the residency. I went to Columbia as well. And um, he, he published probably more papers as a resident than anyone uh, ever, ever before. And also while a resident, you know, founded the softball tournament, which is now an international event, hopefully we'll come back this year, where, um, you know, literally neurosurgery programs all over the country and, and the world are, are clamoring for a spot. I think he told me recently that my, my service here would be about spot 52 on the waiting list or something like that. So um, it's a real pleasure. But uh, it's a testament to, you know, who he is and what he does. And it's, he's not the kind of guy, you know, it, it, any one of us coming out of Columbia, a Sloan Kettering Fellowship, would have been, I think, very, very happy to just rest on your laurels and think, you know, patients are going to come to me. 
And that's not who Rick was and, or is, and that's not how Rick viewed residency and, and his career afterwards. Um, he's committed to hard work and thinking outside of the box and, um, and taking, you know, creating systems um, for success. And I think that's what he's going to share with us today. And I've, I've been fortunate enough to hear this talk before. And I think what people are going to see is that a lot of it's going to make a lot of sense. And then you're going to sit back and be like, well, you know, I don't, I don't do any of that actually, even though it makes a ton of sense. And so um, I, I would say, you know, number one, uh, we're all very fortunate to hear this talk and get reminded of these little things, um, but also, you know, listen to it and pay attention and remind yourself what little steps you could take extra um, to go the distance. And, you know, he's a success story. And I think what he'll show you is that his system that he's developed works. And so uh, I appreciate being here and I, I love hearing this talk. And so Rick, you know, from my end of things, welcome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen here. And just while he does that, let me just say um, that I missed to introduce Vasish, who is a supervisor fellow at the Barrow, a former Baylor resident, so I know him very well. He's an excellent. Uh, and then hopefully Karthik can join us. Residents. And then the final thing I'll say is for the people watching is that if you have any questions you would like us to answer, there's a Q&A box here. And there'll be a, s a session at the end where we discuss uh, any of those questions that you have in that box. So go ahead, feel free to type any questions you have as we move along there. All right, go for it, Dr. K. All right. So, you know, just like Randy said, I, I, I think this talk uh, should really show you that it, it's about, just like he said, forming systems, forming teams. It's about organization. Uh, really, that is so key to your overall success, not just the technical part of neurosurgery. Um, and so this talk is about building a brain tumor center, but just like Randy said, it, it's applicable really to all of medicine, not just even neurosurgery, but vascular spine, functional peds. Anytime you're trying to build a program, build a center, build a practice, these same principles apply and they're never taught during residency. Uh, none of the attendings talk about it. It's never formally taught, which is kind of crazy. You guys spend seven years, eight years, nine years learning how to do neurosurgery, uh, but you have no idea how to get the patients. You know how to take care of the patients, but you have no idea how to get the patients. And to me, that's just, that's a real problem because how are you going to go out in the world and be successful? Yes, you know how to coil an aneurysm, but do you know how to convince the patient who has an aneurysm to have surgery with you or to even get those referrals? And so again, this is not covered during training, but it's really I think one of the most important parts to your overall success. So we'll talk about what are the benefits of building a practice? Well, it's pretty clear if you're in the private practice setting, so it's money. So you're running a business, you got to do cases in terms of covering your overhead. That's pretty clear. But if you're in academics, it's really a lot less clear, right? So there's not a direct financial correlation. Many of us are on salary. Uh, the bonuses are not direct with your RVUs a lot of times. And so we all know a lot of doctors who can survive despite being in the red, so to speak, uh, in academics where they wouldn't survive that way if they were in private practice. And so the question is, why build a practice in academia, right? Again, mainly salaried. Uh, it's not a clear incentive. You've worked your ass off as a resident and a fellow. Now's the time to relax. I remember being a resident at Columbia and being like, I will never work this hard when I'm done. And I can tell you, I've definitely worked harder now than back when I was a resident because it's your practice and it's your patients uh, and you're much more invested. So really the, like the whole concept of finishing and then coasting doesn't really apply. And then this is gonna be the most important slide in the talk. If you're only gonna listen to one slide, it's gonna be this, it's volume is power. And I cannot emphasize that enough. I never understood this back as a resident. I would tell myself, well, these guys are making a lot of money. They're basically salaried. Why not just do one case a week and just enjoy yourself? Like, why are you grinding so hard? And once you become an attending, you realize that whoever holds the volume, whoever holds or actually controls that patient referral base, you then control the power. And by that, I mean, volume is going to be expertise. So just like playing a sport, if you play golf once a month, you're going to be terrible, just like me. If you play it every single day, you're going to be good. Same with surgery. The more often you do these complex cases, the more comfortable you become and the better your outcomes. And then you become a true expert in your field. No one becomes an expert brain tumor surgeon doing one case a month. Uh, volume is going to be training, right? So if you're going to train the next generation of leaders in the field, your residents and your fellows need to see these complex cases early and they have to see them often. 
A volume is going to be data. It's going to be research. It's going to be all of your clinical trials. Volume is going to be um, reputation locally and nationally. And then, and then perhaps the most important volume is going to be programmatic support. So, you know, all of us finish training and we go to a place and we're asked to build something. It could be to build a practice. It could be to build a program, just like I did here. It could be to build an institute, but you're going to go someplace and you're going to be asked to build. And so if you're coming in there and you're doing one case a week and I need a, I need a PA, I need more staff. I need more OR time. Everyone has asks. And if you're doing one case a week, to be quite honest with you, no one's listening to you because you're bringing nothing to the table. You're doing one case a week, two cases a week, and you're not a real player in the game. You start doing five, 10, 15, 20 brain tumors a week. You now have the ear of the administrators because you're controlling that volume and you have the power, you know? And so I would say, instead of going to a place and asking and then producing, produce and then ask. No one's going to listen to you until you've produced. And if you produce the volume and you're producing revenue, at the end of the day, money talks. And if you're bringing in the volume, the hospital and the department and the institution as a whole is going to listen to you and the stuff that you want and you need, they're going to get for you because you have that leverage. So the question is, how do you build volume? Well, it's obviously complex. Um, and, you know, I think in brief, just like Randy said earlier, it really requires work. You leave residency and you think, oh, it's the operating room. Oh, can I, can I tie a, you know, 10 proline and do a bypass and are my hands totally still? I mean, honestly, that's all BS. Surgery is the easy part of what we do. Honestly, there's a lot of great surgeons out there. And if all you do is you go to work and you operate and you go home, you will never build a successful practice. It's, it's all the stuff that goes on outside the OR. It's when you're dealing with doctors. It's when you're dealing with patients. It's the rounding because we all think that we're the best at what we do. And that's why we're neurosurgeons because we all think we're, we're the best and we're all divas really. But at the end of the day, a lot of people can do what we do and they can probably do it even better. So why should someone come to you? And it's not because you went to Columbia and Sloan Kettering and I did all these fellowships. No one cares. No one cares where you did your fellowship. No one cares where you trained. Just realize that a lot of people are competing for the same patients. So always put yourself in the shoes of the referring doctor and ask yourself, why should patients come to you? So the three A's, these, these definitely, you know, drive referral patterns, period, end of story. Uh, number one is you have to be available. And that's just obvious. In the year 2021, it cannot be your office phone. It can definitely not be fax. It's got to be your cell phone. It's got to be texting emails, phone calls, and you got to answer that on like the second ring. If you're nothing but available, you will build a practice. You could be a terrible surgeon, the biggest jerk in the world. If you just answer your phone, you're going to get cases guaranteed. Now, if you can be affable, and by that, it's just obvious, people don't want to deal with a jerk. So if you can just be nice to people and you're pleasant, people will refer you patients. It's literally as simple as that. Just put yourself in the shoes of the referring doctor. If someone answers their phone and they're pleasant, you're going to send patients to them. And lastly is really how good you are. And amazingly, that's the least important, right? If you're, if you're available and you're affable, but you're not good, we all know terrible surgeons who have busy practices and that's because they do have the first two A's, but if you can get all three A's, that's when you can really dominate. So we're going to briefly talk about how to build a program. These are all steps in terms of building, you know, the overall program. And we're going to talk about it in the setting of the Brain Tumor Institute here in Miami. Uh, so when I got here back in late 2011, the goal was to build a comprehensive brain tumor program. Um, a lot of the pieces were here, but it really had not been put together. Um, you know, we had a lot of challenges. We wanted to start a fellowship, train the future leaders, uh, bring in really cutting edge surgical techniques. They did not have that down here, uh, start a tumor bank, database, clinical trials, translational research. And then again, case volume. We had to up the case volume because once you get the volume, everything else falls into place. So what were the challenges? You know, if you talk to JJ and Karthik, they obviously know this, but the brain tumor center uh, was to be housed at the university hospital, which was bought in 2010. Um, it's right across the street from Jackson. Uh, it's a much smaller hospital. It's about 550 beds, small ER, no guaranteed cases, whereas Jackson gets an operative brain tumor per day. UMH literally gets one operative brain tumor 
every two months. So those are guaranteed cases. You don't work for those. They just show up in the ER and you have surgery. So there was no guaranteed cases. Uh, the staff had never done brain tumors. So the nurses, the ORs, the techs, you know, they had no idea how to manage these patients. And it used to be a uh, private hospital. So you have to crack into all of these kind of strong uh, networks that are going on inside the hospital. So step one is really targeted faculty recruitment. And again, this goes for anything, not just tumors, but also spine, vascular, any aspect of neurosurgery. Your first recruit has to be a clinical workhorse, cannot be a researcher or some 50-50 guy. All that is important. You need the 50-50 person. You need the researchers. You need the admins, but that comes later. You really need a workhorse surgeon that's 100% focused on expanding the practice. And once you have volume, as I said, everything else falls into place. So you need to go out and you need to you know, aggressively develop these networks, right? It's just like anything else. Um, we needed to raise, you know, you know, basically educate the area about our program. No one had any idea about the UM brain tumor program. Doctors didn't know about the program. So we went on a mission to kind of inform uh, South Florida about what, what we were offering. So Googled South Florida hospitals. There were 92 hospitals from Key West up to the Treasure Coast, out to Naples. Some were small hospitals, some were major hospitals. But we basically got in touch with all of these hospitals and we asked to speak at, at one of their CME events. Every single hospital, no matter how small, has to have some type of CME event. Larger ones have grand rounds, tumor boards, but, but, but even the smaller hospitals have to have some type of CME event. Uh, luckily, 77 said yes. So we gave 77 talks over 18 months. I think JJ was a junior at this time. Right, JJ? Yeah. How many, how many uh, phone calls did you get to get 77 uh talks was it pretty easy or did you have to like really work them over a uh you know actually most people were pretty cool about it you know if, if you call it and you you phrase it as i'm a new specialist i want to come talk about new techniques or new technology that we're offering for your patients uh you know for the most part everyone was very open to it there were definitely hospitals which felt like i was competing and they blocked me and then I tried to go back door and they blocked me. And then I eventually went to the front door and I got in somehow. But anyway, bottom line is there's always a way in. Uh, but yeah, there was definitely some conflict. You know, certain hospitals don't want to don't want to have that competition uh, come through the door. So then you need to reach out um, in the community. So it's not just about the doctors. It's about um, um, support groups. Support groups are huge no matter what part of neurosurgery you're in. Again, spine, vascular, peds, tumor. These are the major tumor support groups here in South Florida. Uh, Florida Brain Tumor Association, Voices Against Brain Cancer, PAPCOR, and the Women's Cancer Association. So we met with all these groups. We, we were on their board of directors. We spoke at their gala events. Uh, we do research with them. Uh, and, and that way you really have an increased footprint because these support groups really play a major role in terms of referrals. Everyone knows someone who had a brain tumor or who had spine surgery or who had an AVM. So they look for these networks. And so a lot of patients call these support groups and say, I have a glioblastoma. I have a meningioma. Where do I go? And just by being affiliated with these groups, they started sending patients down to us. So you really want to increase your footprint more than just looking at doctors, but also support groups. Um, expanded catchment area. So you're gonna spend time trying to build referrals. Just like I said before, giving talks, meeting doctors, you know, greeting people, shaking hands, but you wanna make sure that you identify gap zones. You don't wanna spend your time, uh, you know, working in an area where it's totally saturated and you can't really get many new referrals. You have to identify what's the best potential growth and this requires some research. So when I got down here, you know, Dade was pretty saturated. Um, UM already had a large proportion of the Dade uh, County brain tumors, but Broward um, and then all the way up, up to Palm Beach, which really isn't that far. It's about an hour and a half, two hours. This area was, it. all these patients were getting diagnosed with brain tumors and they were all flying up to Duke. No one was getting a second opinion. They were just MRI, see your doctor, fly to Durham. So that's clearly a huge opportunity for growth, right? If you have a major brain tumor center and you have all the same technology and all the same clinical trials and you have great surgeons, why would someone who's an hour and a half from you go to Duke? All you got to do is educate them. So we identified these zones and we gave a ton of talks up in Palm Beach and Broward. And that was a, that was a huge boon for us. So, you know, I, I would say that before you start hustling, make sure you do your research and figure out 
where your hustle is going to get you the best bang for your buck. And for us, that was Broward and all the way up to Palm Beach. Um, facilitated referrals. So <clears throat> after you educate doctors, it's not enough that, that the doctors know about you. You got to be more than just available, right? If someone's calling your office or they're, or they're faxing you and stuff, that's all irrelevant in the year 2021. It's going to be sell, text, and email. And like I always say, um, that the most able doctor does not always get the referral. It's the most available one who usually does. So again, it's not the most talented surgeon. It's the one who's available and talented who's going to get the patient. But it's not enough that you're available. You've got to make that referral seamless. Again, always put yourself in the shoes of the referring doctor. So, so if a doctor calls JJ and he's like, hey, JJ, I need you to see this aneurysm patient. And JJ's like, yeah, uh, have them call my office. The doctor's like, well, I, I could have gotten your office number online and you've basically wasted his time and JJ's time. That doctor's gonna call some central line. There's probably gonna be central scheduling. Patient's gonna be scheduled probably two months from now and they're gonna get lost in the system. So the answer needs to be, sure, give me the name and number of the patient and my office will then expedite. So if anyone calls me, hey, I, I need you to see John Smith, right frontal meningioma. I say, okay, text me the name and number, or just give it to me right now. They give me the name, they give me the number. I say, I'll take care of it. You then forward that to your staff and you have them expedite the appointment. You want to make it as easy as possible. So that doctor, the next time they have an aneurysm or a brain tumor or a spinal patient, they're like, yeah, JJ was the best. I called him. He took the information and he just took care of it. They don't want to deal with this just like you don't want to deal with it, you know? And so it's, it's for them as easy as you can make it they're going to they're gonna then refer you more patients. Um, but you need to expedite the office appointments. This is where tumors and vascular are a little bit different than, let's say, spine. People who have spinal problems have had pain for years. They're willing to wait for the quote-unquote best surgeon. But if someone gets diagnosed with a brain tumor or an aneurysm or an AVM, they basically freak out. It could be a one-centimeter meningioma, asymptomatic, nothing to do. But to them, it's life and death. So... These patients have to be seen right away. Building a practice is all about access. It's about getting people into your office. Once they're in your office, in your sphere, they're not gonna go anywhere. They just need to meet you and feel comfortable with your care. But if someone calls my office and they're like, I have a brain tumor, I wanna see Dr. Komatar. And my staff is like, well, you could see him in two weeks. That patient is probably not even going to stay in Florida. They're going to get in a plane and they're going to go to New York or LA or San Francisco or Durham. But, you know, if they're going to be seen, they need to be seen quickly. So my office knows <clears throat> everyone gets seen within two days, every new patient. And so I double, I triple book five days a week. I see people often, you know, like in between surgeries. And my staff says, look, Dr. Komatar will see you the same day, but you'll have to wait maybe four hours, but they're fine with that. As long as you'll see them right away, that's fine. So you need to have a system where you're not having patients wait. If patients wait, they're not going to wait for you. They're going to go find someone else because, because in general, especially when it comes to brain tumors, people are not going to sit home with, with what they think is a ticking time bomb. Uh, fostering collaboration with the community. So this is big. You have to realize that the majority of patients do not come from academia. They come from the community. So if you silo yourself um, in your academic community, if I only relied on UM patients and, you know, anyone in academia only relied on their institution for patients, you're really missing out on 90% of the medical, you know, condition, which is out there. So it's the community, which is where most of the patients come from. So your goal needs to be to integrate your academic center with the community. So why would a private practitioner not want to send their brain tumor patient here to the university, right? We have the best surgeons. We have the best clinical trials. We have the best chemotherapy. We have the best outcomes. So obviously, if you look at it from the outside, it would make sense. Everyone should send their patients to the university. But just think about it for a second. Why would someone not send into academia? And there's so many roadblocks. Number one, they have no idea who to call. Number two, they have no access. So even if they find out, oh, I want to send it to Jacques Morcos, when do you think Jacques Morcos is going to see the patient? His scheduler is going to put it out for like three or four weeks from now. So there's no access. Once Jacques Morcos or anyone else sees the patient, they're going to fax a letter back to that doctor's office. Where does that fax go? It goes in the trash. 
that doctor's never going to know what happened to this patient or who operated or when they operated. And then, you know, these patients inevitably end up staying in the university. You operate on them, they then go see the university radiation oncologist or the university endo, and they never go back to that private practitioner. So why would the private practitioner ever send to the university? And the answer is they shouldn't, and you wouldn't either because you have no idea who to call on all these roadblocks. So what's the solution? Always be available. They have to call your cell phone directly. 90% of my referrals come through my cell phone. I literally get like between five and 10 brain tumor referrals a day on my cell phone. Rick, can you see this patient? They totally bypass the university because the university, you know, it's just a total shit show. For, it's just, everything gets backed up. They see you in two, three, four weeks. Easy access. Everyone gets seen right away. Constant feedback. I'm constantly emailing, texting doctors. Very quick messages. Hey, saw your patient, John Smith, uh, non-operative meningioma, seeing him back in a year. Or seeing your patient, uh, Terry Smith, left temporal glioma, awake surgery tomorrow. Something like that. Something quick, something easy. And then the patient always goes back to the referring physician. This is just practice building 101. Uh, but you'll be shocked at how many people will get referred a patient from a doctor, operate, and then keep it at the university that referring physician is never gonna send you another patient. So just treat that referring doctor like you would like to be treated. And they also wanna build a practice so the patient has to go back to them. And then, so if you can, if you can you know, combine the university and the community, that's when you get the real exponential growth in terms of case volume. Uh, networking, you know, I use Outlook, but you can use any system that you want. Currently at about 8,000 referring physicians here in Florida. That allows me to constantly update them, text and email, MRI collages, which my fellows do. Um, I send them pre and post operative pictures, facts, pointless. If anyone tells you facts, they are so out of the game. Facts is literally irrelevant at this point in time. Uh, so you have to form these relationships and you have to network. And that goes with texting and with email and with phone call. It's about multimodality communication. So this is just an example of a text that I send post-op day one, very simple. Joe Smith doing well, no issues, neuro intact. Home today, MRI confirms gross total resection of his large bifrontal meningioma, Rick Comitar. That took me 10 seconds to dictate. That collage took my fellow two minutes to make. I send this to, to the doctor. You think that he's ever gonna send another brain tumor patient anywhere else? No, because he knows his patient's doing well. He's plugged in. He has an image, so he actually knows what's going on. And he feels like he's part of the patient's care, which he is. And so this is good for the patient. It's good for the referring doctor. And it's definitely good for you because they will trust you in the future. And they'll be like, who was that doctor who sent me the MRI? Meanwhile, it takes you like two minutes to do, but it, it has such an impact because they feel, they feel vested in terms of the patient care. And then if you can, if you can build those networks, Stuff like this happens. And this is one of the things that really blew my mind. This is a patient who came four hours away um, up in Orlando and he came to see me with, with his MRI report. And in the actual MRI report, one large right-sided mass, two, go see Rick Comitar. This is coming from an MRI center four to five hours away in Orlando from a doctor that I have no idea who they are, but I guess they just heard my name. Um, and this patient's locked in. Because now in the actual medical records, it says, go see Rick Omitar. So they're obviously they're going to go see Rick Omitar and you're not leaving it up to the hands of the referring doctor or the oncologist or the neurologist. And so what did I do? I called this MRI center. I spoke to this radiologist. I kept him posted on the case. I told him what the pathology was, how the patient did. I ended up going up there, meeting with all the radiologists. This is one of the largest radiology centers in Florida. And now any single brain tumor whether it be malignant, benign, any brain tumor diagnosed in this MRI center, it says, go see Rick Omitar. So they literally send me like hundreds of cases a year and I'm getting these cases at basically ground zero. And how did I do that? I literally, I guess they got my name and then I was nice about it. I had the, I had the courtesy of calling this guy back saying, yeah, I saw your patient, I forget his name, and the right-sided mass happened to be a GBM, took him to surgery, gross total resection, neuro intact, home day one, you know, texted him two weeks later, patient's still doing well, starting, you know, you know, uh, starting treatment and little things like that. It takes you two seconds, but it really makes an impression. So that was just something that, that, that really blew my mind back when it happened, but it shows the power of networking. 
So this is how I do every single new patient. Uh, everyone can do it differently. This is just one way to do it. Um, so I get a call, text, or email from the doctor saying, please see my patient. I get the name and the info of the patient. Uh, I then forward that onto my schedulers. They, they know that everyone needs to be seen within two days. I see the patient, make a plan. I send a quick text back to the doc. Uh, I do a quick text and email after surgery, quick text and email uh, with the images um, after, uh, you know, after discharge, and then a quick text and email upon follow-up. Now, this seems like a lot of work, and it 100% is a lot of work. I'm not going to downplay it. But if you're organized uh, and you're diligent, this is definitely doable during a normal workday. I handle this as I walk back from the OR. So you just got to, just like Randy said early on, you got to have a system. You got to be organized. You got to be diligent. And if you stop it just operating, you're really missing all the potential for growth. This stuff matters even more than the surgery. Because again, a lot of people can operate. Not many people can do this. Social media, internet, obviously you guys are big into this. Um, you know, you guys do a great job, uh, but it goes with health grades, press Ganey, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, university webpage, <clears throat> and your, and your, and your um, university webpage. Uh, you need to make sure that you as a doctor are going to be accurately reflected on the internet. And by that, I mean, if you're running an innovative clinical trial, if you're doing a new technique, if you're, if you're doing anything interesting, put it on the internet because patients don't know. And I always say that basically shopping for a doctor is like shopping for a bottle of wine. I know nothing about wine. I go into the, you know, store, I look, I pick the coolest looking bottle, uh, you know, but I don't really know anything about wine. Most patients have no idea about doctors, but they're going to go to your website. And if your website says Randy D'Amico, neurosurgeon and nothing else, they're going to be like, wow, this guy's a bum. And even though, even though he's not a bum and he does a lot of great stuff, you got to make sure your web page reflects the type of cutting edge work you're doing. If there's a great publication that, that you had come out, put that publication on your website because just think about it. Anyone who gets referred to you, the first thing they do is they're going to Google you. And they, you know, if they Google you and they don't like what they see, they're going to find someone else. So again, spend time and make sure that your internet presence reflects the type of doctor you are and the high quality work you're doing because patients have no other way to know it. And, you know, universities are going to put up a lot of resistance because they don't really like the doctors having much power, but you got to push back. You got to make sure that your university webpage has some flexibility and it's not just some stupid template that doesn't allow you to modify. It. And if they're going to be stringent, then you get your own, you know, personal website and you can modify that. It's worth the money. I mean, a personal website is like $200 a year and that's well worth it because you can, you can put testimonials on there. You can talk about the good stuff you're doing. So I can't stress enough how much online presence means. This is your biggest marketing tool. And then finally, uh, you know, really focusing in terms of superior clinical outcomes. You know, I always say patients are your biggest source of new referrals. Everything I said so far is important but patients will end up being your biggest referral source. In the year 2021, everyone knows someone who knows someone who had neurosurgery. And so if your patients are happy, they're going to go and they're going to talk about you. And if they're not happy, they're going to go and they're going to talk bad about you. So I always say keep, keep patients as your first priority. And by that, I mean that in organized neurosurgery, there's a lot of quote unquote, like um, distractions. There can be there can be academics, there can be mentoring, there can be meetings, there can be research, there can be lab research. There's, there's so many different avenues in academic neurosurgery that it's easy to get pulled away from, from what really matters. And at the end of the day, we are all neurosurgeons and our patients are by far the most important part of our career. So never lose track that patients are your first priority. Everything else is important. Look, I mean, I love to publish. I love going to meetings. I love mentoring the residents. All, all that stuff is critical, but nothing is more important than my outcomes because that's how, you're, that's how you're validated as a surgeon. So I always say, keep your complications to a minimum. You know, your, your overall reputation as a surgeon, whether you like it or not, is formed in the first three years of your practice. If you come out and I don't care if you come out of the best program in the country, you come out, you're a little bit cavalier, you have, a, you have some major complications, which, you know, really could have been avoided. People are going to label you a hack and it's very hard to get rid of that reputation. You know, you could also 
come out of residency, be safe. People know you're a good surgeon, you're safe. You only have a minimal amount of complications. All of a sudden now you're a good surgeon, you're safe. People are gonna give you carte blanche. And so again, you really need to avoid those avoidable complications. Everyone's gonna have complications. No one's saying that you're not gonna have complications, but again, you gotta keep your outcomes favorable and your cachet, your currency as a neurosurgeon are the outcomes of your patients. It's not your R01. It's not that your program director or chair. In my opinion, what are your outcomes? How do your patients do? And really, that's you really want to lean on that because that's your biggest currency. Um, you know, rounding twice a day, this is critical. Even if you're in the room, five minutes, three minutes, 30 seconds, the patient values that. So you could do the world's most complex surgery. And if you get on a plane and you fly out of the country and you never see them, they're not going to talk you know, well about you, or you could do the world's simplest surgery round on them. And they're going to be like, wow, my doctor was the best. And these people will literally go and they will sing your praise all throughout their family and their friends. And so it's a huge source, you know, of new referrals. And as, as I always say, happy patients eventually means more patients. So just, just by example, we looked at our Florida health data just to see how we were doing looking at our growth and our benchmarks and kind of seeing how we were doing against other hospitals here in Florida. Um, so the growth is, is, is uh, pretty remarkable here. 2011, doing about 200 brain tumors as a department, very steady growth now uh, up to one of the busiest brain tumor programs in the country, uh, up to about 1,200 back in 2019. I think we're almost, almost up to 1,300 now. Uh, but this growth is an example of how everyone buys into the system. Uh, everyone started kind of talking with doctors, you know, being available, seeing patients right away. And so once everyone buys into the system, that's when you can really, really make the jump. Uh, looking at the percentage of cranial surgeries in Florida. So in 2011, less than, less than half percent of all the cranial surgeries. And by 2018, nearly 5% of all the cranial surgeries in Florida. Uh, it's a 1000% increase in just seven years. Um, and if you think about that number, it's pretty incredible. So it's the third most populous state um, in the country. And for every 20 surgeries, one of those cranial surgeries, one in 20, and that includes shunts, is being done at the university, um, you know, hospital here. So very, very proud of that growth. Looking at the distance traveled, 2006, five miles. So it was just, everyone was local here in Miami. No one, no one was really traveling, you know, across the state. Now it's up to 45, 50 miles clearly an example of the marketing um, and the outreach program. Where did the growth occur? You know, more than a quarter outside of South Florida, you know, all along I-95 out to the West coast of Florida, showing that you cannot just sit in one region. You got to maximize your growth by looking at areas of opportunity. Uh, how do we compare with the other hospitals here in Florida? Again, over 1,200 brain tumor surgeries per year. Uh, it's by far the busiest program here in the state, and it's, it's one of the top three in the country. 35% uh, of all the brain tumor surgeries um, in Dade County, 20% of all the brain tumor surgeries in Broward, and 20% of all brain tumor surgeries in Palm Beach. Um, and then again, what is the downstream ripple effect of building this practice? Uh, you know, because it's, it's, it's great to see numbers go up and it's great to see the number of cases, but how does that, as I said, case volume kind of leads to all the other academic pieces. So how did our, our brain tumor program build based off the volume? So we went from 200 cases a year up to 1200. We basically had conventional surgical techniques, and then we got advanced cutting edge surgical techniques. We had very unreliable neuropathology. Now we have three world-class neuropathologists. Again, based on the pressure of the volume. We were always asking for neuropathology, but when you're doing 200 cases a year, no one's listening to you. You're doing 1300 cases a year, they're gonna give you whatever you want. So we now have three world-class neuropathologists. We had one medical neuro-oncologist, we now have four. We had, no, we had no tumor bank, we now have one of the largest in the country. We only had one clinical trial, we now have 15, which is on par with Duke and Sloan Kettering. Uh, we had no dedicated brain tumor researchers. We now have four dedicated NIH-funded brain tumor researchers. We had two brain tumor publications. That's up to nearly 50. That's just an example of getting the residents and the fellows involved. Uh, we had no fellowship. Now we have one of the few brain tumor CAST-approved fellowships in the country, uh, which Randy said no to, but we won't get into that. And then there was this um, growth opportunity uh, 
which we just capitalized. And, and, you know, this is an example of what graduates should be doing and people who are just starting out in their career. You gotta, you gotta take a step back. And before you start grinding, you gotta identify where is the best opportunity for growth. And when you capitalize on that, that's when you can really form a true center of excellence. So thanks to everyone who's down here. Um, I also really want to focus on my fellows. I've been incredibly lucky to have exceptional fellows. Uh, these are the people who allow us to do 1,300 brain tumors a year. These are the people who allow us to do the research, to run the two rooms. Um, so again, can't be done without my fellows. Uh, and then just a little plug. Uh, this is a book which we wrote. It's coming out uh, in the next couple of months. It basically is a summary of everything that, that, that was in this talk. Um, uh, and it should be great. You know, um, Randy is one of the editors, uh, and it just goes into detail about everything that this talk covered. Um, and so this is going to be a great resource in terms of senior residents, chief residents, um, and, and, and really any kind of junior faculty. So, so this will be out soon. And then thanks for having me. Let me know if you guys have any questions. Oh, thanks. thanks so much, Rick. Great. Go ahead, Randy. Yeah, no, I mean, I actually, you know, I had the pleasure of reading that book early and seeing it evolve. And um, it's exactly what, what Rick said. It's basically, you know, in detail strategy guide of everything he just talked about. Uh, and it's going to be a very valuable resource. I mean, I've read it probably five times now. And every time I read it, I remind myself of something that I'm not doing again. And, and you know, you know, buckle down for the next week. It's like, um, it's like the song from Rocky. You know, every time I hear, every time I read it, I'm pumped up and I'm running up the stairs again. Um, you know, we got a bunch of questions. We got a few questions actually from the audience. Uh, just, you know, something that you touched on that I just want to jump on real quick. You know, you start off the talk with volume is power, but then you really harp on the end about outcomes being critically important. So you're not just operating to be operating, right? It's not that kind of volume. And that's a critical thing that I think you have to get out of this. Like you said, outcomes is your currency. And I've used that line, you know, innumerable times in the past year, you know, when I'm up later thinking about a patient and, and, and worrying, you know, did I do something wrong? Um, you know, how do you, how do you choose your indications at that point? Do you go to, you know, your colleagues for help? Um, you know, how do you make sure, how do you ensure your outcomes are going to be great? Yeah, that's a great question. So volume is power, but if your outcomes aren't good, you'll have no volume. And so that's a very important thing when you're just starting out, when you just start out and you're trying to struggle for cases, it's very easy to be like, Mm, should I do this case? It's kind of borderline. Realize that one complication will set your practice back more than 50 positive cases. And that's true. Literally one complication, especially a bad one, a bad complication early on will set you back years. Like a so, preventable complication, especially. Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. I mean, if you, you know, it's again, I, I always bring up the example um, you know, if you talk about like someone like, let's say Mike Sisti, right? Mike Sisti is a phenomenal surgeon, skull based surgeon. Um, he does acoustics with really excellent outcomes. And when you've done it so well for so long and you have a complication, it's almost like the patient's fault. And I'm sure Randy can tell you this. It was like the few times Mike Sisti would have like an acoustic neuroma, facial palsy. People weren't like, oh, what's wrong with Sisti? They were like, how dare the patient get their facial nerve in the way that <laughs> How dare this patient, you know? And it's like, you got to earn that, right? So early on, especially, and I'm sure JJ can tell you this, our M&M is brutal here. And especially with Dr. Harros and Dr. Morcos, they go after you, especially when you're a junior. And it's incredibly, you know, I, I, I really hated it early on, but I can tell you that's a large part of my outcome success. The grilling uh, during m m was so intense here that every patient I saw, I would tell myself, do I want this presented at m m Meaning like if this MRI goes on the screen and this patient has even a wound infection, am I going to be embarrassed being like, why did this patient even have surgery? So always ask yourself, you know, if this patient may or may not need surgery, if this is an m m am I going to be horrifically embarrassed or am I going to be like, yeah, that patient clearly needed surgery. And if you think like that, you're going to avoid the unindicated cases. So my advice is, when, especially when you're starting out, you got to keep your indications ultra clean. If something's questionable, don't do it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And then when you do the surgery, everything has to be crisp and concise and clean. And, you know, people will say, well, 
how do you climb the ladder? You know, like, you know, you know, what do your seniors say about your increased cases? And there can be some competition. No one can say anything to you if your complications are at a minimum. If your outcomes are pristine, literally no one can say anything. It's when you start having complications, people, then you expose yourself. People can say, well, look, this guy's out of control. He's doing cases he shouldn't do. He hurt this patient. So I, again, I can't emphasize enough. Volume is power, but never sacrifice anything for your outcomes. Outcomes are how you're judged. I think that's great uh, advice. Frank, I want to see what Frank's, uh, Frank's thoughts were. He's been, he's been through a similar build as a, uh... Randy and, uh, and and Rick, any any thoughts or things to add uh, from from another competitive market there, Frank? Um, yeah, LA is a competitive market, but I, I I mean I've heard this talk from you, Rick, and it's amazing. I think um, Randy and Jeremiah haven't, you know, I echo your their thoughts. Um, everything in here is gold, and I think the point that it's not given to you, um, probably people won't really understand until they're out practice and it doesn't matter where your fellowship was where your residency was whether you were the best resident whether you were highly recruited whether you have a science paper that you were sitting on when you came in and I had a little bit of that coming out because I you know um had gotten a couple big papers out felt like I was great and then you know patients weren't showing up and it's not intuitive um especially because I think what I took out of that was um, the map and looking where the spots were um, and how far away they're traveling and what your competition is. Because in larger markets like Los Angeles, I mean, you have, you know, in every direction, I'm not going to go through the details, but people that have that area covered or, you know, you assume they have that area covered and you find out there are these um, gaps where you have a huge opportunity and it's up to you to not just hustle randomly, like Rick said so many times, but to find where it is that you need to put in that effort. And then the always having your cell phone available, always doing the job for them, putting yourself in their shoes um, becomes critical. I think the other thing I kind of see, um, and it grows out of what you talked about is um, the research. I am a 50-50 guy. I wasn't the guy that built it up. I luckily kind of sat on the shoulders of some other people. So I think you can't underplay how important this is, no matter how big a part of your practice research is. Um, because, you know, I have um, parts of my upcoming R grants that are going to be based upon uh, the samples I'm getting from patients and the rate at which I have and the size of our tumor bank. And the tumor bank itself, I mean, 3,000 patients in a tumor bank will get you a huge plus with reviewers. So um, know what you're aiming for. If it's research, know how important this is as part of it, but also have a system. I mean, my first year out, I wasn't focused on that, but I also applied to 20 something grants, which I got a decent percentage of, which then I could focus on the practice building. So, you know, whether your system is, I'm gonna do research for this part of the day, just make sure that building a practice is part of it. And uh, for me, it's, I also have to carve out a part of my day or a part of my week for research. JJ, you wanna hit some of these questions? Yeah, I just want to see if Vasish or uh, if any of our oh, yeah, other yeah. have any, have any uh, I guess Vasish is our, our lone fellow here, but uh, yeah. you're about to go through this. Any, any, anything that you have uh, comments or, or questions about how to tackle this? Yeah, um, thanks for that talk, Dr. Komatar. I, I also caught a, an extended version of it here when you were giving BNI Grand Rounds. Um, so uh, what I didn't get to ask you then was uh, in your first maybe year or two, when, when you got a, a complex case um, that you thought you could probably take on, but, um, you know, may have been um, at the, you know, peak, peak of your, your capabilities, did you ever consider sending cases out? Uh, and if so, how did you sort of balance that um, with, uh, you know, wanting to keep keep the, the tap flowing uh, and take on some cases to push yourself forward versus, um, you know, take, taking on a potential complication? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. I think anyone starting out uh, is going to feel that pressure, right? You want to you wanna generate RBUs, you finished, you want to prove that you're independent, and all of a sudden you get like some petroclival meningioma and you're like, oh, right? And so I can tell you that low threshold to involve senior partners. Um, you basically have 
two years, maybe even I would say three years where you can ask for help and no one's going to think anything less of you, right? We, we all have big egos and you're like, oh my God, I'm asking for help from my senior partner. Everyone's going to think I suck and I have no confidence. To be quite no one cares, right? Now you start asking for help four years, five years down the road. Everyone's like, well, what's, what's wrong with this person? But, you know, first or second year, you're just starting out. People are going to think that you're, that you're, that you're conscientious and you're a safe surgeon. You know, it's low threshold. If you see something which is in your wheelhouse, no problem. If you see something uh, that you are worried about, either bring in a senior person because they're going to be happy, you know, to help you with it. Bring them in. Um, or, um, or if it's totally outside of your wheelhouse, then you can send it out. Um, but you can, so, it, so, so there's two different things. If you send a patient out, you can still capture that referring doctor. All right. So there's two different things. If someone comes to you and you're going to operate, that's clearly a way to kind of help build your practice. If someone sends you a patient, which is outside of your scope, you can still call that referring doctor. I saw your patient. We'll discuss at our, at our, at our conference. And then you give it to someone else, but you've still formed that relationship with that doctor and they're still going to send you patients in the future. So there's two separate things. It's, it's one is taking care of the patient. And two is building your practice by forming yet another connection. And I would say low threshold to bring in senior help, especially during your first two or three years. After that, you really should be on your own. And then if you want to refer out, it doesn't mean that you still can't form that connection. I mean, I saw plenty of patients, you know, in my office early on who had vascular problems. I, I don't do vascular, but I still call that referring doctor. Hey, your patient with a, you know, AVM came to my office. I don't do you know, vascular, but Hey, here's my cell phone. Here's my email. What's yours. And they've ended up sending me tumors. So it's two different parts. And again, I, I would say avoid the temptation of doing cases that are going to lead to complications because complications set you way farther back than cases set you forward. Let's put it that way. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I may have a follow-up Sure. Uh, when you took on some cases early on uh, and people asked you, you know, what, what your experience was, uh, how many of these you've done, et cetera, um, did you have a way of handling that smoothly uh, while in instilling some confidence? Yeah, I, I, know, I know the answer to this question. Yeah, I mean, this is actually a pretty funny story. Um, <laughs> yeah, my first day in clinic and it was some huge operative meningioma and I'm like salivating like, oh my God, I got my first case, you know? And the patient was well educated and they were like, how many have you done? I said, this is my first one. It's my first one. I'm super excited. And my parents are coming down and we're going to have a big celebration. It's my first one ever. And they laughed hysterically. They thought I was kidding. They laughed hysterically. <laughs> and they assumed that I had been doing it forever. <laughs> so I just, I just, I told them my first one and that I was going to have a big confetti party as soon as the tumor came out. <laughs> That's great. You know, um, Vasish, one thing that I do, and it kind of gets to what um, Rick was just telling you about your last question, is because uh, I've been through this a lot now, and um, I usually joke around, you know, with the patients. I say, I know I don't have as much gray hair as you know my senior partners do, but um, to be honest with you, if you if you mention your senior partners as someone who's there to assist you, and then you go to your senior partner and you say, hey, look, you know, it's a complicated case. The patient's a little bit wary. Do you want to come up and just meet them with me? Uh, and you tell them, look, I, I think I can handle it, but if you're around, it'd be beneficial. And you kind of stroke your senior partner's ego a little bit. So they're not going to feel that competition with you. You're collaborative. The patient's going to feel better knowing that you've got a team of people, right? And then the worst case scenario is someone else scrubs in with you and helps you out on a complex case. The patient does well, you know, I think it's really win-win. And, um, you know, to echo what Rick also said is you also want to be honest. You never want to be deceitful. And so I think, uh, you know, those are, those are some ways that I approach that. Um, so Rick, someone just asked, uh, do you think you work more or less than other neurosurgeons? Uh, I think I work smarter than other neurosurgeons. And that's a big <laughs> difference. I, I would say I work, I mean, I think in, I think most of us work harder than the average American for sure. So I would say I work on par, probably the same as you or JJ or, you know, Frank or, of the sheesh. I'm sure we all work our off to be honest with you, but it's a matter of making sure you work smart. 
And I can tell you that um, when I first started out, every brain tumor I was totally invested in because I was building my system. <clears throat> so I was basically doing one case a week, but I was doing the entire case. I was every everything from rounding to pre-op to post-op to orders. I was heavily, heavily invested because I was building this system. And then I went to two cases, three cases. And now that it's roughly 20 a week, you know, the system is such where I don't have to work that hard anymore. A patient comes in, I talk to them, they're plugged into the system, the residents, the fellows, the nurses, the anesthesiologists. It's just like a factory line because I've built this system where I don't have to check the Decadron taper on every single patient. You know, now we're doing outpatient neurosurgery and we're doing outpatient brain tumors. We're up to number 100 now. My first 20 outpatient brain tumors, I was literally taking them to MRI, making sure the MRI was done post-op, making sure physical therapy saw them, making sure all the instruction was done. Now I literally text and I say, this meningioma will be outpatient and it's done. It just activates. Physical therapy sees the patient, MRI is done post-op, the nurse is noted discharge at five or 6 p.m. So it's not working harder. Just like you said, it's forming systems, it's forming strategies, and then you can work smarter because there's no way you can do the volume that we're doing here without having a streamlined system. And that's what I would really emphasize. Um, I have a quick question, if you don't mind, that came up. Um, You've obviously kind of been a force of nature doing yourself. I mean, you're writing the book on the subject, literally. And you provide the impetus to get these patients early. But you have a lot of people within the same institution with the same ideas. Has that volume just been because you started it and everyone's just enjoying it now? Or do people at some point feel like you're going to go in this direction, you're going to go in this direction? Especially, maybe not applied to you guys, but like, what is your thought in another group? Like, is it something you guys should coordinate so you're not touching on the same Yeah, I, I would say that, and I'm again, JJ has experience with this. There's the new school and there's the old school. And the old school neurosurgeon, it's just a different generation, right? The people who trained in the 80s and 90s are very different. People who trained in 2000 and 2010s, they like facts. They don't like answering their phone. They think that, because they're, you know, because they're a professor of neurosurgery at so-and-so, that they don't have to grind. And unfortunately, those people are, are going to be dinosaurs. And so I always say, you either get on the train or you get run over. Medicine is a business. We don't like to view it as a business, but it's a business. It's a customer service business. And if you're going to sit there and you think that because of your titles, people are going to come to you, you're in for a rude awakening. And so, so it's a matter of educating your partners to be like, you know, you need buy-in. And so I've been asked this question before, you know, you need buy-in when you're hiring people and you need to surround yourself with people who think like you, because if people don't think like you and they're not willing to put work, then they're going to be ostracized and they're just going to be demolished by your practice building. So you have to hire people that understand the business of brain tumors. Like this is not just operating, you're running a business and it's an enterprise. So you have to educate those people around you. And when you're hiring new people, they need to have the same business sense. So we hired Mike Ivan who did the fellowship. The guy's phenomenal, amazing surgeon, great guy, hustler. We're now gonna hire um, Ashish Shah, who's our chief resident going to the NIH. Another guy who knows our system knows our methodology. Um, and so, you know, you, again, you just need to make sure that everyone's in the same mentality. If someone is not in the same mentality, it, it can definitely lead to strife. Interesting. Thanks. I have a quick um, um, sort of slash half question, half piece of input. Um, could you speak to, um, you know, I think some of your success, uh, having seen it firsthand, had to do with a good call on where to take a job. Would you have any thoughts about how someone can identify a place that is ripe for the kind of growth you've experienced compared to some other places that may be more challenging? Yeah. So my job search was, was interesting. So this is back in 2011. Uh, I thought for sure I was going to stay in New York. Uh, I'm from New York. My family's in New York. I, you know, I trained there uh, and there were just no good jobs in New York. 
And so I looked around um, and Miami happened to have a job, even though I had emailed them three months earlier, they said no job. I'd emailed them a year earlier, they said no job. And they kept saying no. And they finally said yes, because of this new hospital, which they had bought and they had, and they had opened up. And I remember talking to Phil Guten, who was the chairman back then um, up, at, up at Sloan Kettering. And he said to me, who's doing tumors down in Miami? And I said, Heros and Morcos. And he's like, those guys are not doing tumors. They're doing skull base and vascular. He's like, who's doing tumors? Who's doing neuro-oncology? And I said, no one. He's like, you got to take that job. He's like, you're going to dominate because there's no one there to kind of compete with even in the institution. So I would say no matter what job you're looking for, no matter what specialty it's in, you got to look at the potential for growth. And I don't mean showing up for your interview and being like, where are my cases coming from? Because there's nothing more annoying than someone who's like, where are my cases coming from? The answer is like, go get them, you know, like you gotta earn it. And so, you know, it's like, where are my cases coming from? It's like, you know, like none of this is given. And so, you know, when you're looking for a job, you got to look and say to yourself, who's in front of me, who are my colleagues and how long I'm the number one. And in New York, it would have been 20 years till I was, I was the number one someplace. And in Miami, I was the number one, basically day one. And so seeing who's ahead of you, seeing who your mentors are, um, is a big deal and seeing where that potential for growth is. Good man. It means New York's cut down to what? 11 now, 11 years left. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to wait. <laughs> no, I think that's awesome. great advice. Yeah. I, I think, I think going into a very saturated place makes this much more challenging, um, you know, than, than, um, than going into due to a place that has kind of that perfect storm where, where you bring expertise that is not there or is not there in a major way. Um, and you can bring that. Yeah. And I will you tell also you though, you know, realize that your, that your first job is almost never your last job. Um, I frankly think my first job is my last job because this job is amazing. But for, for most people, your first job is not your last job. And I'm sure JJ can attest to that, right? You get your foot in the door, you build a name, reputation, and then you make a jump. You don't want to make too many jumps because then all of a sudden everyone's like, what's wrong with this person? But but your first job, does it will never be a perfect job because if it was perfect, it wouldn't exist. You just need your foot in the door, build a name, build a reputation, get involved, you know, organize neuro, um, uh, neurosurgery, and then potentially jump to a job in a better city, better, you know, institution later on. Yeah, I think identifying good good candidate jobs is an extremely important part of this. But but that said, even if the place is relatively saturated, quote unquote, like Frank has done, I mean, I think you can also you can also build and and Randy as well. You can build a practice. It just may not be those curves that that you showed, you know, as easily. My curves not as good. No, I will. <laughs> My curves definitely not as good as that. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, you know, one, one of the key things, though, is, is, again, just evaluating that landscape. And so you don't need to be the only guy doing neuro-oncology. You need to look around and see what other people aren't doing, right? And so, you know, in New York, you know, I look around and I see everyone's, you know, a minimum probably 10 years older than I am. And there's things they're not doing, right? They're not as active on social media. They're not as active on the Internet. They're not participating in these webinars. Um, and it's hard, you know, because a lot of hospital systems have taken this kind of hub and spoke model. So a lot of your referring physicians are members of other systems in these, you know, saturated areas. But this all goes back to outcomes, right? If your outcomes are good, you're going to meet these other people because it's such a close proximity. And they're going to, you know, you get two or three good outcomes with the same referring provider. They're going to understand that you're, that you're good at what you do and that you're, you're taking care of their patients. And honestly, they, they may or may not jump ship from where they send normally, you know? Yeah. So let me, so, so let me, you know, like there was an example back when I started here, I basically called around and I was cold calling doctors around the area, neurologists, oncologists. I, I was just calling them up and I said, Hey, you know, you know, this is my name. I'm new to Miami. I'm a you know specialist in brain tumors. Who do you send your brain tumors now? And inevitably they would say, we send to Jacques Morcos or we send to Haros. And my answer would always be the same. They're amazing. They're fantastic. If you ever can't reach them, here's my cell phone. Guess what? They can never reach them. <laughs> so they're always going to send their patients. 
They, you know, so you don't badmouth your colleagues because honestly, Harris and Morcos are obviously phenomenal surgeons. I'm not saying I'm a better surgeon, but guess what? Here's my cell phone. Call me anytime. Happy to see your patient. <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> we got, um, do you want to hit some of these other questions or, or Vashish, any? Uh, I had a quick one. Uh, I don't want to jump the, jump the line. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, I keep coming back to complications, but, uh, you know, I'm going to a vascular practice, so I expect to <laughs> run into a few. Um, so when you had a, a complication, uh, how did you handle it? Not with the patient necessarily, but with your referring doc or, um, you know, at tumor board or with your, you know, oncology colleagues, how did you either explain it or kind of handle it and, and still keep that connection and that referral source? Sure. So I think everyone's, everyone's reaction to a complication is the same, right? You immediately want to hide. You're embarrassed. You're trying to like cover your tracks. Like that's like your initial and I mean, that's just normal human instinct. If anyone tells me that they're not feeling that during a complication, they're lying, right? You have a complication, you are horrified, you feel sick and you want it to go away and you wish that no one knew about it. <clears throat> you have to fight that initial feeling. And the only thing worse than a complication is someone hiding a complication. Oh, yes. Hiding a complication is just disgusting in my opinion. And even though you your initial feeling is to hide it because you don't want anyone to know because, I mean, you know, these are embarrassing. Complications, if you were to pick one word, I would say a complication is embarrassing because you're competing with your colleagues. We're all neurosurgeons. <clears throat> and as I said, your cachet, your currency are your outcomes. So a complication is an embarrassment, but you have to fight that initial feeling and you take it head on and you just explain. And you have to realize that everyone has complications, literally everyone has complications. And if someone doesn't have complications, they're either lying or they're not operating. So realize that no one is going to think less of you for a complication. They will think less of you if you're like, oh, no, it, was, it, it wasn't me. It was the nurse or it was, you know, you start making, making excuses, nothing worse than that. So, you know, what do I do? I, I take it in the chin at m, &M. I say, yeah, that was a decision. I was way too aggressive. Going back, I wouldn't have done that. You know, that's number one. You know, take it on the chin. Never blame the resident, ever. That is just, in my opinion, vile. Even if the resident did something wrong, guess what? You gave the resident autonomy and you let them do the case. So it's on you. So I've had cases where the resident messes up and they do something wrong. And during m, &M I say, yeah, it was on me. My fault. I did it wrong. And then you talk to the resident in private and you're like, that was that, you know? But you never blame the resident. You never blame the system. Take responsibility. And you have to be honest with the referring doctor. Look, I have complications just like anyone else. And when they happen, I tell the referring doctor, hey, look, your patient that I operated on four days ago had a large venous infarct. And we reoperated. He'll be in the hospital a couple more days. And I explain it to him. He's not going to think less of you. I mean, what doctor doesn't understand the complications happen, especially if the surgery is indicated and it's a tough surgery, you just explain it to them, but they're not going to think less of you. They're going to think less of you if you dodge the bullet and you try to blame someone else, especially a resident. I agree with every word of that. And I would add that it very much helps if you do the right thing, the right surgery for the right reason, for the right pathology. And if the bad thing happened, you did all those steps correct, then, and you and you take it like Dr. <laughs> and explain it like Dr. Komatar said, then I think it helps out a lot. I think it's a lot harder um, to have that confidence if you're doing borderline cases or, or doing something the wrong way and it's not really the right fit for the situation. And just like you said, think about putting this in front of all your colleagues and would you defend each one of these steps? Is it defensible? Uh, you know, is it indicated? Is it kind of borderline? And, and the more confident you are that you did the right thing for the right reason and then the bad thing happened, um, the, the more, the easier it is to say, yes, it was my fault or, or, you know, this happened and it was an unfortunate complication, but we did the right surgery. Um, you know, all those types yeah, of, yeah. I mean, I, like I had a patient a couple of weeks ago, it was this lady who had a huge meningioma. She's 50. She's relatively young, <clears throat> huge meningioma. Surgery goes great. Day one, massive PE and dies. I mean, there's nothing that I could have done differently except 
not operated. Now imagine that was a questionable case. Imagine it was like a one centimeter meningioma in someone who's 70 years old. And I'm like, well, I need the RVUs. I'm just gonna slip it in here. Complication rates like 1%. And then they get a PE and die and that goes up at m and and everyone's like, what the, like, why are you taking that out? And all of a sudden that sets you back like years. Absolutely. Everyone's like, yo, this guy's a maniac. He's operating on people with who don't need surgery. So always tell yourself, if that film goes up on m M&M, if that MRI goes up there, am I going to be embarrassed or am I going to say, yeah, that needed surgery and I'm willing to take any downstream effects of a complication because that person needed surgery. Ask yourself that. Agree. Agree. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? I mean, I think this, this is amazing talk. I've seen this in person, uh, in practice, and it's amazing uh, on the outcomes you can have um, kind of following this, the three A's plus all the details that he shared, which is real gold. Um, uh, I, I would also add that this works for private practice as well, although, although it's in the frame of, in the frame of academics in some of the slides. I mean, I think these principles are dead on for, for any kind of private practice you could ever want to uh, endeavor into as well in, in our field. Um, any other thoughts, Frank uh, or, or Randy? And if not, we can, uh, we can clo close things. No, it was great. I, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna maybe buy that book and use it as a reference. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks guys. I mean, it's, just, it's my Rocky song, I'm telling you. <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's a great book. And obviously, thanks to Randy for, for all of his hard work. He was one of the main editors who, <clears throat> who really chimed in. I think, I think it, there's, a real, there's a real lack of information on this, on this topic. I mean, every single one of us went through residency. <clears throat> and I don't know about anyone else, but this was never covered during residency. And I just kind of figured it out on my own. And I feel like, I feel like it would be a great resource for, for, for trainees and for young attendings because this really should be formalized. I mean, it's such a important part of your success. And if you don't understand the business side of medicine, you're really, you're, you're really short changing yourself, you know? You know, one thing I would add, and again, I know we're running short on time, this relationship building, um, this, those three A's, they start in residency. You know, I ended up, a lot of people I'd imagine do either working at the same institution or in the same town and the same setting. You know, I can't tell you the number of times I've called neuro-oncologist I worked with during training and been like, hey, I'm in, I'm in business now. I'm down the road. You know, I saw so-and-so or if you ever need to call or chat anyone up, you know, I'm, I'm here. Um, and it works. And so I, this, you're never too, it's never too early to start doing this stuff. And so it's never too early to start learning about it either. All right. Um, I think unless anyone has any other comments, I, I think we'll... We'll uh, conclude things here. So I really want to thank uh, Dr. Komatar for his amazing talk, uh, Dr. Atanello, as well as Dr. Diamico, um, and, uh, and Dr. Srinivasan for joining us today. Um, phenomenal talk. As, as all the previous people mentioned, I think this is, this is extremely important and, and very, very well communicated. Um, and uh, and um, other than that, I would like to say that this should be edited. Maybe uh, Becky will have to edit it a little bit more than some because the InRef tries not to put the language uh, uh, bombs on the on the on the YouTube. I've noticed, but this should be up and uh, and and be a tremendous resource uh, going forward for for residents that who were busy and couldn't make it um, live. Um, also, please join us on May 30th. We'll send this out on social media. Um, the uh, the last session of the year um, with Dr. Marsh. Uh, is coming up. And then we have a new announcement that um, on starting on the 23rd of May, uh, if I said March 30th, I said May 30th, the 23rd of May, the week before, um, we're going to start having a four-part sub-I series. So um, training for sub-interns uh, who are going into their some internships this summer. It'll be exclusive for the fourth years. Um, and we will have some lectures, but also breakout sessions with a curriculum that's been vetted through being used last year during the pandemic um, that everyone can sign up for. So keep an eye out on social media for that as well. Um, I just, again, wanted to uh, let everyone know that these will be up on YouTube. It takes about, I don't know, Becky, what do you think about a week um, for them to be posted? And we'll post about when they're up on YouTube as well. Thanks again to Dr. Komatar and the entire team, Anna Rodriguez and Becky Struer, uh, Anna, our medical student who I didn't get her nice picture up on our slides due to whatever problems going on with these slides. 
Um, and Becky, who does all a lot of the hard work behind the scenes um, with NREF, thank you both for all that you do to make this possible. And uh, thanks to all, all everyone for coming and see you again next time and have a nice evening. Take care, guys. Thanks. Right. Talk to you all later.